All right, wonderful, thank you. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out of your precious Saturday mornings to join us today. Uh, when I look at this crowd, I see parents, I see friends, uh, and I'm taken back to the time when I myself had to make uh, this important decision uh, about joining university. I'm Shamir. I'm a year three geography student together with the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and I'm really, really, really excited uh, for everyone here to experience the platform that we're offering today. So we are confident that after today, uh, you will have taken your first step into one of the most rewarding journeys of your life. We are aware of the importance of this decision, and we have provided this platform uh, so that you can take all the information that you need to make that leap forward. At this event, we have gathered professors, students, and staff for you to engage with, speak to, and find out more about what CHS has to offer, and experience what it's like to be part of the NUS community. So without further ado, I would now like to pass the time to our esteemed Dean, Professor Lionel Wee, who will give his welcoming speech. Professor Wee, please. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for accepting our invitation to spend uh, your morning with us to experience the learning at FASS. For those of you who are not familiar with the College of Humanities and Sciences, our aim here is to prepare you for a constantly changing world. By the time you graduate, uh, the world will be even more complex, and it's our goal to help you to be adaptable, resilient, and empathetic. Uh, these are qualities that will help you flourish. The CHS core curriculum provides you with strong foundations in reading, writing, critical thinking, and numeracy. It will expand your learning capabilities and enhance your ability to think and integrate knowledge and insights across many different disciplines. This is an ability that's integral to solving complex problems. What I would like to do for the next few minutes is to use the opportunity to try to address and dispel some myths. For example, some of you may be concerned that you will not be able to get the major of your choice. This is not true. The CHS, FESS program offers great flexibility and choice. With very few exceptions, you are in fact guaranteed the major of your choice. For those of you who do not want to commit to a major yet, you can most certainly spend your first year exploring before making a decision. And if you have chosen a major and later on decide to pursue another discipline that suits you better, you can change your major within the first four semesters without any fuss. We offer many combinations and possibilities from a wide range of 20 majors. You can pursue them as a primary major, a second major, or a double major. We also offer over 30 disciplinary and multidisciplinary majors, so you can broaden your educational journey with us. You can combine your passion for the humanities with the sciences or with any other field seamlessly. In other words, if you're already committed to a specific major, we will accommodate that. If you have not made up your mind, there's no rush. And if you later change your mind, that is not a problem. With that, I hope you enjoy our master classes delivered by some of our best educators. Our colleagues and students are also here, ready to answer questions that you may have. And I look forward to welcoming you to FESS and to NUS. See you. Thank you, Dean. Next up, to give you a little taste of what FASS has to offer, please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Deborah Shamoon from the Department of Japanese Studies, who will give her master class on anime and the Japanese. Professor Shamoon, please. Oh, hello. Hi, oh my goodness. This is my first time lecturing in person with no mask on <laughs> in years now. All right, thank you. 
Great, thank you so much for being here today. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I am Professor Shamoon, and I teach in the Department of Japanese Studies. I'm originally from the United States, but I've been teaching here at NUS for 10 years now. And, and my area is Japanese popular culture, and film, uh, also literature, and art history. Uh, so my topic for today is uh, understanding limited animation this is a little taste of how I teach about anime in the department. But before we get to that, I think the bigger question is, why study popular media, right? Why talk about something like anime or manga in an academic context? Uh, and, and as I always tell my students, uh, this is not just to sit back and have fun and watch a movie. You don't need to take a class to learn how to be a fan. You can do that on your own. What we're doing in my modules is learning critical thinking skills. Uh, and these are the skills that you need, uh, not just for the university, but also in your future career. So the lower order thinking skills are things like memorization, uh, which you all become extremely proficient in in your secondary education. But the purpose of a university education is to level up uh, and to move up on this chart from just uh, memorizing and understanding what it is you're memorizing to be able to apply this information in new ways to create your own arguments, to evaluate, and then eventually to create. Uh, and these are the habits of mind that you are learning here. Uh, and studying popular media or literature or film or uh, art history, these are all tools in order to practice these critical thinking skills. The other purpose for studying popular media is that we are surrounded by this all the time. Whether or not you are a fan, we are completely awash in visual media. And we need to learn to be smart consumers of this. We need to learn to understand how these uh, things are created, how the messages are being put across, in order to be able to evaluate and judge what it is that we are consuming. Uh, so uh, the focus for my talk today is on animation, but in my other modules, I also talk about things like looking at popular media to understand stereotypes about gender and race, or stereotypes about Japan in order to combat those stereotypes and learn how to do better and not just replicate the same biases over and over again. Okay, so today we're talking about animation. And I'm going to focus on hand-drawn animation because this is how anime got started through hand-drawn animation for television. And even though today a lot of anime is created using computer animation, it still purposely mimics hand-drawn techniques. And so we need to understand this in order to understand why anime looks the way that it does. Uh, and so anime is created, or you know, historically it was created by drawing or painting on cells, that is clear plastic, celluloid, or acetate, and then layering those cells, and uh, uh, some of the bottom layers wouldn't move necessarily, or maybe just the top layer would move, and you would draw, you know, create the drawing over and over again uh, to create the illusion of movement. Uh, although, when you're doing hand-drawn animation in this way, you really can only have four layers of cells because the more layers you have, the more the plastic starts to uh, uh, warp under the camera and you can see the layers, you can see the shadows. So the way that this is done, it's incredibly labor intensive and time consuming. Uh, there are a lot of people involved, but uh, the key animator is the person who is responsible for drawing the keyframes that is the extremes of motion. And the in-betweeners are the ones who draw the in-between frames, that, but the way that they draw this can influence the final product. So say if, if you're drawing an animated arm like this, the keyframe would be here, here, and here, but the in-betweeners can make it look like this, or they can make it look like this, right? Okay, and then this is a picture of an animation camera stand, the way that it used to look when they were doing this uh, all by hand. The camera is up here at the top, um, and the layers of the cells are here and they're held in place. Uh, and, and the camera can zoom in or out or it can pan side to side. 
So in order to understand why these things look the way that we do, we need to know a little bit about film. Uh, so the magic number for live action film to make it look lifelike, like smooth movement, is 24 frames per second. That refers to the frames of the celluloid that are going in front of the uh, camera. So uh, and animators quickly realized that they could have that number uh, and, and have 12 frames per second and it would still look lifelike and realistic. Uh, so uh, this creates smooth motion, uh, and, and it's used by Disney in their films, especially the early animated films. And another thing that they would do was record the dialogue first and make the animation suit the way that the actor was speaking. But this is incredibly expensive to do it this way. And so limited animation developed as a cheaper budgetary alternative. And they cut the frame rate down to eight or even six frames per second. But when you cut it that far, it becomes very choppy. It's really noticeable and not very lifelike. They also do all of these other things that I've listed here in order to save money. So repeating the backgrounds, taking the same image and just flipping it or showing the same image over and over again, uh, moving the camera instead of drawing movement, so panning or zooming, uh, or even sliding the cell underneath in, uh, in front of the camera. Um, Sometimes the dialogue is recorded after, but even if the dialogue is recorded before, there's not a lot of emphasis on matching up the, the mouse movements very exactly. Um, and so everything that they can do to minimize the amount of movement. And this is used for TV animation, uh, not just in Japan, also in other places as well, but in Japan, uh, they really tried in the 1950s to produce fully animated films like Disney, but they just couldn't compete. And so instead, the focus was really on limited animation on television. And that's where anime, the way that we think of it today, developed. Now, probably most of you have seen movies by uh, Studio Ghibli, Miyazaki Hayao. He falls somewhere in between this. He is uh, right on the border in between full and limited animation. But it's important to note that he does not consider what he is doing anime. He thinks of this term, and a lot of people in Japan think of this term very specifically as television animation, especially the kind of giant robot science fiction shows that are popular with otaku or hardcore fans. Uh, and what he's doing is something different. I don't have time to talk about uh, Studio Ghibli today, but I'm happy to answer questions about that. Uh, so what we think of as anime today is the limited animation that developed on television. And the first animated TV show on uh, TV in Japan was Tetsuan Atomu. Uh, it was translated as Astro Boy in English. And this was by Tezuka Osamu, and he was adapting the manga that he had uh, published 10 years earlier. Uh, and I'm sure you all know this story. This is a, a, about a robot boy. It's kind of a Pinocchio story. And this was wildly popular. Uh, and, and he used all of these limited animation techniques, especially the first season, it's extremely limited. And so you can see all of these things, like they're just very um, simple movements with the hands. Uh, they only need to have two different cells that they cycle. And then here uh, you can see the camera zooming in on the woman and the child, uh, or uh, just holding over the still face of, uh, yeah, so the camera's moving instead of the drawing moving and then, uh, the still frame. The other thing that Tezuka did that was really important for the development of the anime industry was that he sold the uh, rights to the TV show to the studio at a loss. So he was not making any money on this show and he made up the shortfall in merchandising. And his first tie-up was with Meiji chocolate for this marble chocolate. Uh, and you could get these stickers as a prize inside the tube of marble chocolate. 
And, and this was really the beginning of the way that the anime industry is still set up today. So uh, the money comes not from broadcasting these things on the air, but from all of the franchising around it. So from intensive uh, merchandising, and uh, this is also uh, what's called the media mix in Japan, which means that uh, these titles are not just standalone things usually on television or in manga, but they're part of massive franchises uh, that exist across manga, anime, video games, light novels, uh, and there's any, you can enter these franchises in any way. There's no one story that is the, the canonical one. Uh, the other thing that uh, Tezuka did that was really important was the character design uh, and what scholars call dynamic stillness. So this uh, character design for Astro Boy, uh, you can sense a lot of movement even though there's no movement here. Uh, and so one of the features of limited animation, the way that it developed in Japan, is that there's a very strong emphasis on character design. And so uh, you have very elaborate or dynamic characters, and you can tell who the character is just by the outline. I should have just an outline here. And you would know instantly that it's Atomu by his hairstyle. And this is true even of uh, anime today. Um, like One Piece, uh, you know who the main character is just from the, the outline. Okay. All right, so uh, just some additional examples of the way that limited animation looks uh, and, and the way that it gives its distinctive uh, look and pacing to anime. Uh, from this series, Mako Go Go, uh, this was also a manga that was made into an anime in 1967. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why both of these series uh, could have so much success with very limited animation was because readers were already emotionally invested in these characters from having read the manga. They knew the stories. And so uh, to make the transition from reading a manga, which doesn't move at all, to an anime that moves even a little tiny bit was very exciting. Uh, and that emotional engagement with the characters was making up for the shortfall in the animation style. All right, so here you can see this is uh, from an, an opening scene of Speed Racer. It's about a you know, race car. You can see how flat this animation looks. So they're trying to give you the illusion of movement into 3D space, but they can't do it realistically because the image is so flat. Uh, and this is one of the features of uh, anime on television, that it, movement tends to be sideways uh, and, and two-dimensional. They can't realistically show 3D motion. And so the animators came up with many different creative ways of making things look visually interesting and exciting even when using very, very limited animation techniques. So you can see some of these techniques here, right? They're just shaking the cell uh, instead of actually animating the, the car, right? And here, they're moving the background and the, car and the wheels slightly, but actually the car is not moving, right? And the camera also is zooming in on it slowly. And it gives the illusion of the car moving. But again, the car is moving sideways because you can't really show movement in depth very easily. And, and then this is the, the final moment of that same sequence. Again, trying to show movement in, th in depth, but you can't really do it. So instead, they kind of cheat, and most of the time, you're seeing sideways movement. So this uh, limited animation style, the jerky movements, uh, and the uh, character design, all of this began for budgetary reasons, but it developed into a national style. And now, many directors purposely use limited animation even if they have the budget for full animation, uh, because this is the way that anime uh, has its distinctive look. And one theoretical tool for discussing this kind of flatness in limited animation uh, is super flat. Now this term super flat was invented by Murakami Takashi who was a fine artist. He did an exhibition in the year 2000 that he called super flat. Uh, and one of the things that he did in that exhibition was to put up images of classical Japanese art and images of animation down at the bottom here. These are stills from an, uh, an anime TV show. 
Uh, and to say that there has been a tendency in Japanese art for centuries towards flatness uh, and towards a kind of dynamic, uh, dynamic stillness uh, and uh, this kind of uh, sideways motion uh, to create visual interest even when there's a lot of flatness. Uh, so I also teach a module in art history, and I can say a lot more about super flat, but I will leave that aside for now. Uh, but just super flat is another way of talking about this distinctive uh, flatness in anime. Okay, and then the last thing I want to talk about uh, with anime is uh, another example, Mobile Suit Gundam. This is another gigantic franchise that's still extremely popular. I think it just came out with a new installment this year. Uh, but the first uh, installment was the TV series in 1979. This is a giant robot show uh, set in outer space. And uh, most giant robot TV shows were, uh, at this point, for young children. And they were essentially 30-minute 30 30-minute uh, commercials for toys. Uh, and uh, that was the case here with uh, Tomino Yoshiyuki. He was approached by uh, the toy maker Bandai, or, I'm sorry, the toy maker Clover, uh, with these toys that were already ready-made uh, and meant to be played with by very young children. But Tomino wanted to tell a much more sophisticated, nuanced story, and it didn't really hit with the kids. Uh, and so Tomino, or, uh, Clover canceled the series because it wasn't doing well. But luckily for Tomino, uh, it, it got picked up by Bandai instead. Uh, and uh, Bandai really let him uh, go crazy with his more sophisticated, uh, more nuanced, in-depth storyline. Uh, and sorry, I skipped over some of these. He also uses all of these super flat techniques. So uh, in all of the super, the uh, limited animation techniques, this is you know battle in outer space, but they're using a lot of um, abstract, strobing, flashing lights to create visual interest. And this becomes a very exciting battle scene, even though it is relatively easy to animate because it's uh, a lot, all these abstract shapes and flashing lights. Uh, and this moment here is the emotional climax of the series as the two main characters confront each other and they have a kind of psychic meeting. And that's represented abstractly with all of these flashing lights behind them. In, in the real story, they are inside their giant robots. Uh, but this kind of uh, abstract, uh, diagonal movement, uh, repeated motion in the background is what I am talking about with the super flat limited animation style, the way that the animators in Japan very cleverly and skillfully exploited the limited animation techniques at their disposal in order to create something really uh, creative and emotionally engaging. Okay, so uh, Tomino got the go-ahead from Bandai to uh, continue with his stories for older teens. And the other thing that Bandai did was instead of marketing to young children, they marketed their products to uh, older teens and adults. And instead of ready-made toys, they created what was called the uh, Gundam plastic model, which was shortened to Gunpla in Japanese. Uh, and so it's this model kit that you put together. Uh, so clearly this is not for children, and you're going to need that cup of coffee if you're going to put that whole thing together. But also these are not toys. They're not meant to be played with. They're meant to be collected. Uh, and they had tremendous success with this. And Clover went out of business in 1983, and now Bandai is Japan's biggest toy maker, and uh, the Gundam franchise is still going strong today. Uh, this was also the beginning of the otaku fan culture in Japan. The viewers of this story got very, very emotionally invested in it, uh, and also very interested in the animation. Uh, and uh, this is, I'll very briefly mention, another theoretical tool that we use to talk about 
uh, anime is from this book, Otaku, by Azuma Hiroki, which has been translated into English. And he talks about something that he calls database consumption. So he says that there was a big shift in otaku culture between Gundam in the 1980s and uh, a later series that came out in the 1990s and later. And he says the fans of Gundam uh, were primarily interested in the storyline and uh, the emotional arc of the characters. But for fans after that, uh, what they were really interested in is something that he calls the Moe Kyara database, the uh, details of character design. Uh, and, and he gives this example of DigiCarrot, which is a compilation of various character design features that the otaku like. Uh, and, and there's no story behind this character. This is not, this character doesn't belong to an anime series. Um, but because the fans recognize these character traits, they can uh, attribute uh, personality traits to her. And so what the otaku do is they create a mental database of all of these character traits and they see how they're combined across series. Uh, and so what they're consuming is this database. They're not consuming the story or uh, the story in itself. What they're looking for is all of these character traits. And this explains why anime uh, at the surface looks very uh, repetitive, why you see the same tropes and uh, the same characters over and over again, because that's what the fans are getting from it. OK. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I've given you just a very brief taste of how we talk about anime in my modules. It's about a lot more than the themes, the characters, and the plot. Uh, in my modules, we look very closely at the form. Uh, and that is the way that animation is created and the visual images that we're seeing and how that creates meaning for us as viewers. We also look at the production and the fan cultures, and we look at the history, not just what's popular right now. And as I said earlier, discussing these topics in class is a means to practice critical thinking skills. Uh, and, and I ask students to formulate original ideas about these topics in oral presentations and also to improve their writing skills and writing research papers on these topics. So uh, and also, I'll add in general, uh, and it, it is good to remember that uh, and, you can come and take any of these topics in my modules. I te teach low-level modules, uh, which are open to any major. Uh, but I also teach advanced modules that are open to Japanese studies majors. And Japanese studies is particularly in, in demand by employers in Singapore who are looking for graduates with knowledge in Japanese language and culture. Uh, so I'm happy to answer more questions about that. I'm also the department coordinator for study abroad to Japan, and I'm happy to answer questions about that as well. All right, so that's it for today. Thank you very much. Uh, and we still have a few more minutes. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Can you answer for both? Uh, yeah, please. Uh, are there any misconceptions about uh, Japanese studies or Korean studies? Like it's oh, the mic. <laughs> Yes, wonderful. Ah. All right, uh, so I'll just repeat. Are there any uh, misconceptions about Japanese studies or the faculty um, as a whole that you can help us to clarify? Sure. Uh, I think the number one misconception that students have is that they need to already know Japanese language before they can take any of our modules or declare a Japanese studies major, and that's not true at all. Uh, I mean, if you all do have background in Japanese language, that's great. Uh, but you, we, most of our students start from zero, so don't expect that you need to have any prior knowledge. Uh, and all of our modules in the department are taught in English. Uh, and, and if you are a Japanese studies major, then you also take Japanese language modules at the same time. But the content modules where we're talking about things like this, they're taught in English and they're open to anyone. Uh, at any level, uh, up to uh, the 3,000 level, we have students from every major who come in and take them. Yeah, other questions? Oh, 
I think the other big misconception is that this is just something that you do for fun or that it's not uh, a serious major or that it's not going to get you a job. Uh, when you finish, and that is not true. Our majors do extremely well in the job market because they have uh, Japanese language ability, which is a hard skill, uh, like a concrete skill that uh, is very much in demand. Uh, the other advantage of Japanese studies is that we are a small department, and so uh, Except for our entry level modules, uh, which are quite large, the, all of the modules in the major are very small. And so you get a lot of uh, attention from the faculty. And the uh, batches of students also become very close. And so uh, it's a really positive and nurturing community. Yeah, other questions? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions about uh, anime or about Japan. I know we have some fans here. No. Okay, well, if there's no questions, then I think we're done for the day. I, I will be hanging around for a little bit if you want to ask me questions one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and there's also a table in the other room if you want to come talk to my colleagues. We don't only teach about popular culture in the department. We cover every topic related to Japan, including history uh, and, and linguistics. So uh, please do come and talk to us about that. Thank you.